Thank you, Lori. Our program this evening is being presented by Tom Wessels. Tom is a terrestrial ecologist and professor emeritus at Antioch University, where he founded their master's degree program in conservation biology. He is the author of numerous books, including Forest Forensics and Reading the Forest, Landscape, A Natural History of New England, both of which have a place on my bookshelf. Tom's most recent book is titled, New England's Roadside Ecology, Explore 30 of the Region's Unique Natural Areas. He's conducted workshops on ecology and sustainability throughout the country for over three decades. Tom will start us off tonight with an introduction on how to interpret forest landscapes. Then he'll lead us through an interpretation of some photos from here at the Cary property. And then finally, more photos that have been submitted by folks from the audience tonight. So it's my pleasure to welcome Tom Wessels and turn the program to him. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. Um, so I guess what I'll do is just give a short introduction to the process of reading uh, forested landscapes for anyone who might not be familiar with this sort of approach. Um, so when I'm out in the woods, one of the first things I'm looking at is to see if I'm picking up any changes in the structure of the forest as I'm wandering through it. So if there's a change of structure, that means I'm either seeing, you know, I'm going from a, a dense forest with a lot of smaller trees to one that is more open with larger trees. Whenever I see that, I know that there's been some sort of disturbance event that has altered the first forest I entered that had the younger trees. And then I start looking for the type of evidence to see if it was a logging event or if it was a blowdown or if it's recently abandoned agricultural land. Uh, possibly a fire. Uh, the other thing I look for are changes in composition of species. And when I see a change in composition of species, like I'm in one type of forest and then I all of a sudden walk into another one, I'm going to start very much looking for what I call eco-indicator species. These are species that have very specific site conditions they grow in. And if I start seeing them, then I'm usually looking at a change in soil composition or a change in topographic setting. But if the change in composition is only involving generalists, these are species that can grow pretty much anywhere, then again, I'm looking at a, ch a change due to some form of disturbance. And again, I'll start looking at the evidence uh, to pin down what that was. And it's not just being able to identify whether an area has been logged or there's a blowdown or is abandoned from agricultural land. You can also actually date when those things happened and start um, actually putting sort of a real history together of that forest. So that's sort of um, the nuts and bolts of reading forested landscape history. So I think we'll be doing that a lot tonight. We might get into other topics based on the slides we see, but I'd say we ought to probably just go right to the slides. And I encourage anyone, if you have questions, you can, uh, you know, raise them. Uh, and uh, Lori, she'll be monitoring them. Um, if they seem like they're really pertinent to the slide, she'll uh, then mention the question and I'll, I'll address it. And I might have, for people who took the slides, I may also have questions for them about things I might not be seeing that maybe you know about. But anyways, this is the first shot. Uh, as you can see, it's an overview of um, the Cary campus. And I'll just let, you know, maybe Mike say a word or two about it, and then we'll go on from there. Thanks, Tom. This is, as you said, an aerial view from the Cary Institute's main campus in the Mid-Hudson Valley region in New York State. The Cary property is about 2,000 acres. It's a post-agricultural landscape. It was formerly 14 small farms, and at its peak, about 70% of the land was cleared for agriculture. It was abandoned over the course of the last 200 years at different times, and right now we're primarily forested. So that's what we're working with. All right, so I guess we'll go to the next slide. All right, so here I'm seeing right away, um, it looks like there's a tree on the right that may be a weevil hit white pine. Um, it, it forks pretty low and grows up and it looks like it might uh, fork again. The left-hand fork looks like it forks again. If that's the case, and it looks like there might be another one in the background, sort of central background in there, again, looking like it might have three trunks um, coming from one 
trunk. So what that would indicate was this was once open land, uh, most likely abandoned from agriculture. Um, and these pines were the first cohort of trees that, that came in. So white pine weevils are a native insect, but they only um, lay their eggs in the very upper terminal shoot of young pines growing in full sunlight because they want a terminal shoot that's about as fat around as a finger. And uh, trees, as they get older, pines, they get older, the terminal shoots get smaller. If they're growing in the shade, they're quite a bit smaller and the weevil won't go for them. So if you see a, a cohort of weevil hit pines, they're a good indicator. They're the first cohort of trees to move into a one, once open site. And with uh, pines, what's really good about them is um, if they're young enough, you can count their limb world. Pines put down one tier of limbs every year. And generally, if they're 30 years or less in age, you can actually count the number of limb worlds and then date when that area was abandoned. Or it could have been there was a heavy logging and the pine came in at that point. Um, but that's what I'm seeing here, unless there's something else, Mike, you think I might be missing. That looks like it to me, Tom. It's a little bit of a bowl area. Yeah. Yeah, I see that. And actually, it looks like the surficial topography looks pretty smooth and even, even though we have that bowl there. Uh, if these are glacial till soils at this site, then that looks to me like it was plowed in the past, either at one time for crop field or hay field. Um, most likely probably past your time of abandonment, but um, that's what I'm picking up. So surficial topography, uh, if you look at the, the surface of a forest, uh, you know, sub, I mean, you know, forest floor, um, if there have been blowdowns in that forest, the roots rip up out of the ground, excavating a pit, and then you have the upturned root system and all the excavated earth. And when those roots rot, that earth is deposited as a mound. So you get what's called pit and mound topography. And after a couple of centuries, our forest floors become carpeted in these things. So if they're missing, <coughs> excuse me, that means they were most likely removed by plowing. Again, either to create hay fields or crop fields. So I guess we can go on to the next slide. All right, well, I'm seeing skunk cabbage here and looks like some um, uh, other plants as well that like uh, sort of moist, somewhat enriched, uh, you know, soils like the jack in the pulpit that's in the foreground. Um, and so it's interesting up where I am in Maine, uh, our skunk cabbage grows in spruce wetlands, uh, which is something I wasn't used to when growing up in Connecticut, where all the skunk cabbage I saw was in basically uh, broad-leaved hardwood forests, like we're seeing in this slide here. Um, also, we have, a, it looks like possibly a, a black birch seedling growing up out of that moss on a downed log. Um, odds are that log that has the moss on it might have been a white pine. White pine uh, rots slowly from the outside in after about 20 years, they shed their bark. Then by about 25 to 30 years, they're getting a nice mat of moss on the decaying wood. And um, that's a really good germination site for small seeded uh, trees like black birch, yellow birch, hemlock. So um, I'm guessing that the odds are that that down tree with the moss uh, was probably a white pine. And if there's no other questions or comments, I guess we'll go on to the next one. So Tom, I see a hand up from a Robin Smith. I'm gonna allow her to talk. Okay. Robin, I'm gonna unmute you. Go ahead, floor is yours. Let's see. Hmm. Hmm. Leslie, is that something you're able to do from your end? Um, Robin, you can unmute yourself. You're going to have to take that extra step. Well, while, so I also have one more person. Let's see if this works here. Jane Sokolow. And so I'm going to allow her to talk. Let's see if this works. Jane, you just need to unmute yourself. Yeah, I actually didn't have a question. I just wanted him to comment on the Jack and the Pulpits and the wild. Oh, coming up. <laughs> Excellent. What, what do you want me to comment about them? 
just where they grow, I guess. Oh. You know? Well, they like they like you know pretty much in 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 rich moist sites. So um, you know that's a, a site they like to be in. I mean, it's not super enriched, but it's not uh, certainly um, you know a nutrient poor site. All right, I guess we'll go on with this one. Now, this looks to me like it's probably a barn foundation. Um, the stonework here, it's got too many openings in it to be a cellar hole for a house. And the furthest section of the wall uh, near the top of the shot uh, is not below grade, it's above grade. So uh, I'm guessing this is a foundation for a barn. And um, it looks like, I'm just trying to see uh, the trees around it don't look that old. I'm, I'm th think I'm seeing a, a maple on the right. Uh, they look like, you know, pole sized trees, maybe up around a foot or so in diameter. So it may be that this was all open land abandoned back, uh, you know, maybe the, the middle of uh, the 20th century, a little later. Um, but again, um, the barn uh, in the in the foreground here. So if there's no questions or comments about that, we can move on. The next slide. All right, so this looks like a stone dump to me. That's what I'm seeing here. I'm seeing a lot of stone that is sort of piled right in the center of the shot here. Um, I can't see uh, the size of these stones, Mike. So are there many fist size stones in this pile of stone here? Tom, it's a pile of rounded stones. Many of them are fist size to softball size, and it's sort of on the edge of a slope. Yeah. So this would be the result of a past crop field. So crop fields about the only things that generate a lot of small stone. That's why I was asking about the size of a fist, because stones like that will not usually surface out of a uh, a hay field. They certainly don't surface out of a forest floor. <clears throat> so I'm guessing that this was above this, this slope was a crop field. And this was just a convenient place to take all the stones that were collected every year after plowing and just dump them over the, the, in the embankment there. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty confident we have a crop field above that, that stone pile. Any questions with that? Maybe I can just elaborate on that a little bit. So um, rocks in our forest do not come out of the ground. Um, we can get some rocks moving up out of the ground in hay fields, but they're generally quite large. Uh, small rocks don't. And the same thing in our lawns. We don't usually have rocks, small rocks surfacing out of our lawns because the roots of grass and trees and shrubs, the perennial roots, stitch everything together in the soil as a unit. And so when the ground freezes in the wintertime and expands and rises and then settles in the, the spring thaw, the rocks are held in place in the ground by those roots, but it's only crop fields um, that lack perennial roots that freeze and thaw cycles will bring rocks to the surface. Um, so I'm sure any of you that have vegetable gardens that you turn over about, you know, this time of year, um, you're probably wondering like, well, all the rocks you picked out have been replaced by a new cohort. You might be thinking that, gee, are they reproducing? No, it's just the freeze and thaw cycles, slowly lever them up, you know, a couple inches every year and eventually they surface and get picked out. All right, next slide. All right, so here we have a stone fence um, running off, you know, in the distance there. Again, I can't tell from this shot uh, the size of the rocks, but it looks like it might be a single stack wall. That means one stacks of rocks laid up. Generally, if that's the case and there's no small fist-sized rocks incorporated into a wall like that, then it's a wall that uh, basically separated uh, hay fields from pastures. Uh, these walls were functional. They, you know, many people think they're built to demarc boundaries. Uh, it's much easier just to basically put in some posts to mark a boundary or flag trees on the boundary than to build a stone fence. Uh, these fences were built to keep livestock in pastures uh, or out of crop fields or hay fields. So 
Uh, again, the ground looks pretty smooth and even on both sides of this wall. I'm not seeing pits and mounds. So, Mike, are there many fist-sized small rocks in this wall? There are a few intermixed with the flat ones. Uh huh. And there are some some wood posts on the one side of the wall. You can see a double one there at the break. I can see that. So, my guess is that maybe you know one side of this wall might have been. Uh, crop field at one time, um, which means that the other side would have been pasture. There's no sense in building a fence like this uh, unless you keep livestock in or out of something. So um, probably at one time, crop field one side and maybe pasture in the other. Uh, and I'm sure those posts uh, probably have some wire on them. <clears throat> so they'd be a later vintage uh, fencing probably for, for, for dairy cows or something like that. All right, next slide. So we, we had, Tom, a question about the stone pile. Yes. And Tom Barjun was wondering if rocks are much larger than 10 inches and greater in pile, what do you think? Is that also likely a stone dump? Uh, probably a stone dump. It's, you know, um, the only other thing you could get looking like that might be a rock outcrop that is mm -hmm. weathering rock out of it. Um, but if you're getting a, a whole amount of rock in one spot and then on either side of it you're not seeing any rock that's definitely a stone dump um where the rock was taken to just get rid of super thanks all right so this is a downed either pine or hemlock i can't tell because i can't tell if there's <clears throat> limb whirls present on this or not hemlock don't make distinct limb whirls but um in any case it's not a hardwood tree i can see you know, a number of limbs coming out at the same point. Um, again, uh, these trees rot from the outside in slowly. Uh, so Mike, you took the shot. Are there distinct limb whirls in these, these the limb arrangements here? There are not. And this is in amongst a hemlock grove, Tom? All right. So that's what I'm guessing hemlock because that's how you distinguish it. And uh, it looks like there's one good sized one right to the left of that down log. Um, you know, just a little bit further down. And we had two questions about the previous slide. Someone was wondering if the walls were originally meant to keep livestock in, who thought that. And then someone else was wondering, one side of the wall has a lot of brush and the other doesn't. Can you surmise anything from this? Yeah, definitely. That's a good observation. So the wall uh, onto, on the, the right-hand side of the wall, that was abandoned pretty recently because there's very young trees and shrubs in there. And on the left-hand side, you can see that the trees are, are larger in diameter and whatever. So I should have picked up on that right away. But um, definitely the, uh, the right-hand side of that wall definitely abandoned quite recently. And that's why you have all that, that sort of uh, younger growth there. And what was the question about livestock, um, Lori? Sure, the question was about the height of the walls, about how oh. high thought that they were and were they meant to keep livestock yes they're definitely now generally these stone fences went up to about waist height it's one thing lifting up rocks like this quite another I have to do something like that so uh generally uh to keep livestock in they would then use cross poles or cross you know poles on either side of the wall with a rail across the top of it so the combination of the three foot high stone fence and then the poles and rail we're usually adequate in keeping livestock in pastures or out of crop fields or hay fields. And then someone was wondering, and this I know nothing about, early settlers <laughs> usually had pigs, not cattle. When did this turnover take place? From pigs to cattle? Uh, basically, dairy farming comes in with the advent of rail. So rail uh, allows now farmers to get their dairy products into urban centers pretty quickly. And so that becomes a big market farming opportunity. So that's generally, you know, around the time of the Civil War, we really start seeing transition of farms to becoming dairy farms. And someone was wondering if it was true that glacial till was used for stone walls in New England. Well, the rocks in the till was used for sure. So glacial till is just a hodgepodge of materials. You can be sand and gravel and clay and stones and boulders. So the rocks uh, would have come out of working the land for hay fields or crop fields. 
and then be used uh, to go into wall construction. Now, one thing I should mention, these walls weren't built right off the bat. Uh, preferred fencing initially would have been split rail zigzag fencing that just zigzagged across the landscape along the border of a, a crop field or a pasture. Uh, but when you start getting, like Mike said, 70% deforestation uh, on this like carry property, then there's not really enough wood anymore to replace the wood fencing. So when that happens, people have to go back to stone dumps, bring the stone back to make stone fences. All right, let's keep moving along, I guess. All right, so this looks like uh, a tip up of a down tree. I, I, that's what I'm guessing that's the root system that came out of the ground. And uh, um, um, if you look, there are two arrows on the bottom pointing at an unusual tree with a hollow at one side oh, and then sort okay. of a, a ridge that runs up the tree. Yes, I'm seeing that. Okay, I'm seeing it definitely. Okay, so this. Um, this looks like a tree that got hit by a <clears throat> got hit by lightning. And so the lightning will, you know, all of our trees are genetically programmed to have a spiral in their their growth of their trunk. And this is part of what's called their phylotaxy. As the tree is growing up and turning, it means the limbs get offset. They don't end up right above each other. Um, so the direction of spiral, in this case, if you're looking up, the spiral is going, it's turning to the left as you're looking up. Direction of spiral is genetically determined. And uh, only about, you know, a few percent of our trees spiral in this direction. Most of our trees, as you're looking up, they spiral to the right. So that's genetically determined. But the intensity of the spiral is environmentally determined. So if uh, a tree can really grow up quickly and really gain height, pretty fast, it's almost like taking a spring and pulling on it, the nature of that spiral is reduced. Um, but if a tree, for whatever reason, gets suppressed in its upward growth, the spiral becomes quite intense. So that's a great adaptation if you're a tree on a windy ridge top, where you're going to be wind stunted, you'll get a very strong spiral in your trunk growth, which means your trunk becomes really strong and hard for breakage. Um, the reason I'm saying this, this scar probably was lightning. Lightning will follow the path of the spiral in a trunk. So my guess is this tree got hit by lightning, blew off bark uh, along that, that, that scar, which then grew over callus wood. And sometimes that callus wood grows over and comes together, starts coming out, making almost like a fin of wood coming out of it. So that's what's going on uh, with that tree, which looks to be a maple. And, okay, any other questions or comments on this slide? So someone was wondering if the direction of the spiral was determined by the species. No, the only, the, it's it's pretty much like, it doesn't relate to species except for one, one species of tree. Um, pretty much all of our trees, I'd say about 97% of them spiral to the right <clears throat> and 3% go to the other way. But the one species of tree that seems to defy this is, uh, um, uh, Atlantic white cedar. That is a tree that most of the time when I see them, they're spiraling to the left. The majority of them spiral to the left. So that's sort of the Atlantic white cedar is sort of the exception to the rule. And is there any advantage to doing that? Spiraling to the left? If there is, yeah. I'm not aware of it, but there's probably a reason. I mean, these things probably aren't just happenstance, but I'm not aware what that would be. Excellent. That was another question that just came in. All right, next slide. All right, so I'm seeing a mound back in here, um, which is sort of unusual feature. There's a, and it looks like there's a lot of younger trees on that mound than the surrounding forest. Um, so I'm not sure what's going on. Mike, can you give me more information on that? Tom, um, this is along a creek. Um, the trees are mostly laying north-south uh, there are a number of them down in that kind of direction. Um, and you're right, there's a sort of a mound there and the trees on that mound are much younger, uh, black birch, uh -huh. uh, replacing mostly white pines that have fallen. Any idea what, I mean, if that mound's not rock, it doesn't look like rock to me. So that's a feature that was 
built up in some way. It's not a natural feature, I don't think. Um, any evidence of like a barrow nearby, like a, you know, a, a sand pit or something that maybe excavated there, material was pushed up there? Yes, there is a, a, a gravel bank somewhere in the vicinity of this, a little, not too far away. And then it also, there was an event that took place there a, a few years ago in terms of a, a windstorm, I think. Uh -huh. So what time of day was this uh, shot taken? Uh, early afternoon, I believe. Early afternoon. All right, so it looks like the winds were coming out of sort of north, northeast. Uh, that one trunk that we're seeing in the foreground there um, it's pointing towards the southwest. So if they're all the trees are lined up this way, you know, we're, we're looking at possibly something like a nor'easter, although, uh, well, I guess that's possible for where you are in Millbrook. That's not that far inland. Um, so that might be the nature of the event of the storm. Might have been a nor'easter that did that blowdown. Someone is asking if it could be a drumlin. You know, it looks awfully small for a drumlin. It could be, but I then I expect to see others. Well, is this a, a lone feature in this area, uh, Mike? Yes, is, it is it, a lone feature, but it is it's also close to those hollows as well. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of low topography in this area and gravelly soils. Other yeah, folks are wondering if it could be a brush pile or a sawmill site. It's pretty big for a sawmill site or a brush pile. I mean, it looks solid to me. I'm guessing. I'm guessing it was just material that was moved. Like if you had a you know gravel pit, there might have been soil on the top that was pushed off and piled up there uh, to get to the gravel. Um, something like that would be my guess. And we have a number of folks very fascinated with the spiraling of the previous slide. And, and uh -huh. one person wanted to know: Are there other reasons that trees produce a thin-like protrusion? Um, generally, it's always due to some sort of uh, scarring. Now it can happen from frost cracking. So uh, a tree, if it's facing due south and has darker bark, the bark can heat up, expand. And uh, then as it gets cold, uh, that bark's going to contract at a faster rate than the wood underneath and it can crack open. So, you know, anything that's going to cause a crack in the, in the wood, a scarring in the wood, um, or the bark, I should say, then, then you need a callus wood that's going to try to heal over that and oftentimes will grow out in a fin-like structure. All right, next slide. All right, definitely some weevil hit pines again. Um, looks like uh, that one, if that is one individual tree in the middle there, then that was a tree that uh, was growing on its own uh, at time of abandonment because Generally, if uh, trees or a bunch of young pines are growing up after abandonment, they can sense the nature of, you know, other trees around them and will generally only produce after the, the, the leader is killed, just throw up two new trunks. Uh, but if you're getting like in this case, it looks like there's about six of them. That means the whole limb whirl below the leader took off. And that usually means the tree was growing all by itself in the open and sensed it had lots of light and lots of room and it could you know easily accommodate growing uh six trunks uh you know after the uh the, the death of the leader any questions or comments with that all right i guess we'll continue on the next one all right, definitely a, a basal scar. This looks like it's either an ash or a tulip tree. Um, and uh, it almost looks like someone put a chainsaw to it as well. Uh, there's a little, looks like a little chainsaw mark there. But anyways, a basal scar like this, um, either the result of a logging operation where a log was dragged by this tree and ripped the bark off, or it could have been a collision of a woods vehicle with the tree. Um, but something, you know, hit the base of this tree and ripped the bark off, making that basal scar. Um, if there was another tree behind us um, and had a basal scar that was facing this basal scar, that's very good evidence of logging. So when, you get, when you're getting opposing basal scars where two trees have basal scars that are facing each other, that's pretty good evidence of logging where logs are being dragged through the woods and 
hit one tree, then hit another tree, creating the basal scarring. And again, um, very smooth and even ground here. So, uh, you know, um, if if some of this is lowland stuff that you were talking about, Mike, that's sands and gravels, well, they don't often make pillows and cradles. So that might be the case here with a lot of this land. Uh, <clears throat> but if it is glacial till, then it has been plowed. This is, a, I think, a hickory tree. Uh, there are no yeah. other trees with basal scars around it. Uh-huh. So yeah, I guess what a probably a bitternut hickory. If that's a bitternut, that's a big, big tree. Yeah. Yeah. We had a comment about the previous slide. Uh -huh. One of the guests was mentioning that the branching of the weevil trees we've shown is very close to the ground. And the ones they're used to seeing seem to first get hit when they're more like 10 or 20 feet high. So it was just a Yeah, they can get hit anywhere between a couple feet up to maybe as much as 30 feet. Uh Generally, after about 15 years, the tree is getting too old to really attract weevils. Um, but yes, this tree was hit at a very young age uh, because it had a, you know, a big terminal shoot only a few feet off the ground. And then on the next slide that we were just at, someone was wondering what the two similar sized trunks might tell us. Well, this is a tree that was definitely uh, cut at one point and then stump sprouted two trunks um, so the trunks are the exact same age, most likely, and the same, probably the same size. Uh, so our hardwood trees, when they are cut, uh, will stump sprout, and they can send up two, three, four, five, six, or more stump sprouts. So ones that really do this vigorously are red maples and red oaks. Um, they can throw up a lot of stump sprouts. Our other trees, like hickories, ash, maples will, like red, I mean, sugar maple will usually only you know, create two, maybe at most three trunks when they stump sprout. And then Carrie, Charlie Cannon mentioned it's probably a pig nut hickory. So that's... It could be a pig nut. It, it could be. The bark looks pretty regular, but I guess it could be a pig nut as well. Yeah. All right, next one. All right, so here we have a tree that snapped off. I'm guessing this is a, a tree that was a probably uh, an open grown tree looking at the large limb on the left hand side. It grew up next to a stone fence. And in this case, it looks like um, the ground on the right hand side is a little bit higher up than the ground on the left hand side. So we may have a, a road bed down on the left hand side there. And this tree, you know, grew up pretty much in the open. So would have um, thrown out low limbs growing out in both directions uh, over the wall, as well as out towards that road area there. And then the other shot has um, a piece of decaying wood that's coated in charcoal mat fungus. And that fungus uh, occurs in late stages of decay of basically three types of trees when they get car carpeted like this. Those would be maples, beech, or elm. Um, and looking at the tree that uh, broke off, that looks like to me like a maple. So I'm guessing this is probably the limb of a maple that got covered in uh, charcoal mat fungus, usually by about 20 to 25 years uh, into the decay process. Um, that's an old, excuse me, an old sugar maple along an old farm road. And the, the whole tree is showing that black coating that looks like it was burned. Yeah, and the one thing that's beautiful about this charcoal mat fungus, uh, if you have charcoal and you rub it, it's gonna make you know sort of black smears on your fingers. If you rub this charcoal mat fungus, it won't darken your fingers at all. And actually you can start to see um, the, the part of this uh, rotting piece of wood closest to us looks sort of fluted. Um, often it looks like these things have been worked with a wood gouge. Uh, they're, they're, they're quite pretty, but um, again, it's just the natural decay process, again, in, in sugar maple, beech, and uh, elm. So, Tom, we have um, a raised hand from Catherine Schneider in the audience. I'm going to unmute her. Let's see if this works. <clears throat> so, Catherine, you should be able to unmute yourself and talk now. I, I didn't mean to raise my hand. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. Not at all. <laughs> it happens, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, next slide. 
All right, so again, this looks like another blowdown. We have trees that fell from the right to the left. Um, you can see the uprooted uh, tip ups uh, in the lower um, uh, you know, right hand shot. And again, um, we can figure out the type of storm this was. Uh, if the winds are coming out of the west, it's most likely associated with thunderstorm microbursts. If they're coming out of the east, either the occasional hurricane or nor'easter. Um, so any sense of what direction they fell in, Mike? Yeah, they've, their <coughs> falls are towards the south, southwest, and they're headed the other direction. Okay. So again, probably uh, winds out of the southwest, that, that again would most likely be thunderstorm related. And it's been a while. I mean, they look like they might have been pines. I think I see limb whirls on them. And it looks like some of the bark is still intact, but some of it has come off. Um, so I think we're looking at an event that happened maybe if those if those are pines and they're starting to shed their bark, uh, the event happened probably between 10 and 20 years ago. Those are white pines. Okay. All right, next slide. All right, now this is obviously, I think, uh, a crop field because <clears throat> we have a stone fence here, but if you'll notice the, the ground on the right-hand side is right at the top of the stone fence and the ground on the left-hand side is down quite a bit. And we're on a gentle slope that's sloping up to the right. So generally on crop fields, uh, the, the plow is taken across the contour, pushing the plow furrow down slope. And every year that meant soil be migrating down and eventually filled up that stone fence on the top side of the crop field wall. So this originally would have been crop field um, and then it could have you know, transitioned to hay field or pasture after that. But <clears throat> that difference in height on each side of the wall is definitely a great example of a, a former crop field. And it looks like the area down below was abandoned more recently again smaller sizes of trees it looks like down there uh, although i can't really see many of the trees on the uphill side i can only see the ones that are growing on the border right along the wall um so maybe that's not the case um but in any case uh certainly a former crop field okay if there's no questions or comments about that we can continue on <clears throat> All right, so I'm seeing what looks like a coniferous forest with a lot of um, regeneration of hardwoods. Um, I can't quite tell the species. Uh, can you, so Mike, what type of trees were those, those hardwood trees? Yeah, they're mostly uh, black birch underneath either pine or hemlock. Okay, so for get, to get black birch like that, um, we need to have the leaf litter really disturbed because they need bare soil to seed into. So we either had a logging operation in here, which I'm not seeing any stumps, um, or we had uh, a surficial fire, which burned up the leaf litter and allowed those black birch to come in. Um, so it's one of those two things that are happening. If there were stumps there, I'd say logging, but I'm not seeing them. So fire might be a possibility. Um, any knowledge on this site, Mike? I don't know what caused that or what the history there is beyond the, the growth we see. Yeah, so whatever it was, something removed leaf litter to allow those black birch to come in. It looks like it wasn't that long ago. I mean, those don't look like very old understory trees, you know, maybe 10, 15 years, something like that. It is along the creek, and so it does occasionally flood. Well, it's, it looks like it's going up slope to the right there. That'd be quite the flooding. Well, I guess we need to go out and check it out, but uh, I guess we can go on the next slide unless there's any questions or comments. All right, so is this um, in the understory here, is this barberry? It is all barberry. Under okay. Yeah, under looks like maple. Maple, pine. sycamore, a um, few small pines. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so this must be, I'm guessing this might be down by the stream since you got sycamore in here. It's well, actually an upland site, um, 
but it's it's near a disturbed area that was uh, planted for horticultural crops. Okay. Well, in any case, yeah, the barberry uh, showing how it can be really invasive, and once it gets established like this, it that that becomes a big job to get to get it out of there. But it can be done. Um, but certainly, yeah, it's really, really established quite well in there. And we had a couple of questions about the previous slide. Someone was wondering if if jumping worms were eating the leaf litter. And someone else was wondering if turkey removes leaf Well, litter. you know, turkeys, uh, it's a possibility, but there's just, it looks so ubiquitous across the site that that seems a little bit odd because they do, they, they, you know, they'd have to be a really big troop to really, do up that much area all at the same time. Uh, but turkeys are a really major factor. I remember, remember when I was, uh, you know, in my undergraduate degree in the late 60s, early 70s, we were taught that uh, you would never see uh, white pine regenerating under an oak canopy uh, because the oak leaf litter would restrict, uh, you know, any germination. And sure enough, every time we went to an oak forest at that time, back in the late 60s, early 70s, you'd never find white pine. Today you do because of turkeys, because turkeys coming through do scrape up that leaf litter, expose the soil so that small seeded trees can establish. So it's a possibility, I guess, with turkeys um, doing this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but comment was earthworm invasions. And that's a possibility too. I haven't, you know, that is something I am not familiar with. So I can't speak to that. Um, because where I am, we haven't we haven't had any of the jumping worms or worms like that yet invade. So I haven't really seen sites like that. So, but I guess that could be a possibility if all the leaf litter was eaten for sure. And then someone was wondering what is the best way to get rid of barberry. Well, that you know, I, when I when I get rid of it, I only it's it's because I only have one or two you know shrubs here or there. I just clip it down and then I keep going back uh, every uh, week or two and just snipping any little new shoots coming up. And after a, you know, a year or two of that activity, it's uh, I've starved the root system. But when you have it like uh, in the next slide, an area like that, you, you can't do that. You're gonna have to do some other treatment. All right, next slide. <clears throat> All right, again, looks like more weevilled uh, pines. And then we have what looks like a sheep fence in the foreground. Is that fencing, Mike, that I'm looking at? I think it's it's a row of very small saplings oh, for some okay. reason. All right, um, I'm seeing, I just couldn't see if there's cross hatching in there or not. Um, yeah, so again, you know, another area of abandoned land, the pine came in as the first cohort, got weevil hit again, pretty low down. And uh, is there anything else I'm missing here? That's it. Okay. Next slide, I guess. Okay. So is this a, a, a beech tree? I'm guessing it might be a beech tree. Um, it was certainly an open grown tree, uh, you know, forking really young. Um, and uh, if you look inside it, you're going to see a lot of roots growing down. So <clears throat> those are roots that the, the tree actually sprouted to sort of take advantage of the decaying sort of uh, debris inside of there. Um, so I don't know if that's a new tree attempting to grow. I think that's the roots that were growing out of the original tree, uh, sort of digesting all of its rotting material. Um, if there is roots of a living tree in there, then they'd be probably growing up from down below, um, coming up into that cavity from down below. But I'd have to see that for sure. But I'm, I'm guessing those, those might be roots that germinated out of that tree as it was decaying. Uh, and you know, this is not uncommon in trees to see them sprouting roots <clears throat> on the insides of their trunks. And Someone mentioned adventitious roots. Yes, that'd be a great way to explain it, yes. And then we have a raised hand that I'm going to allow to talk. I believe this is Clive Jones and I believe it might be on a previous slide, but we're gonna see. And let's see, Clive, are you on? Yes, sorry. Um, I think 
I think my question was answered. Oh, wonderful. I did. I asked about turkeys and earthworms. Okay. Uh, got it. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Next slide. All right, so here we definitely have uh, a rock outcropper, a boulder, and then it looks like a stone fence next to it. Um, so this stone fence, it looks like it's pretty short. Um, so is that the case? Is this fence just a, a very short section of fence and does it curve at all? So Carol, if you are there, I'd like to know if that that stone fence is short, and if it's curved. Well, I guess Carol's maybe not there. The reason I'm asking is some stonework like this is of Native American origin, and their walls uh, had various functional roles. They weren't for keeping livestock in or out of pastures or anything like that. Uh, but the walls generally were short in length, uh, usually not much more than hundred feet long and they usually curved. So that's why I was asking because that that could be the case here. This is you're look, we're looking at Native American stonework there. And so Carol is on and she commented in the QA, she said that is as much of the wall as survives. It's not that it's curving per se. Okay. So I mean um if that's all that survived that means that either someone came and took those rocks away to repurpose them somewhere if that didn't happen, then I'd still say that it, it could be of Native American origin. That's a possibility. All right, next slide, I guess. Someone was wondering, Tom, what was the purpose of the curved walls that the Native Americans built? Well, I mean, it's it was for all sorts of, I mean, I think ritualistic use. Uh, they did a lot with monitoring solstices and equinoxes and things like calendar events and things like that. <clears throat> Those sorts of stone fences would usually have standing stones in them. Um, but I'm not exactly sure. I mean, there's a lot of stonework in the Northeast that we know is of indigenous origin. And actually, uh, even tribal elders today don't even know what some of it is because the traditions were lost in that regard. Um, so for example, on uh, in Glastonbury Mountain in the south uh, western corner of Vermont, just a little bit south of the summit, which is right around 4,000 feet, and this is miles from where anyone lived or farmed or anything, there are these two rows of circular flat-topped round cairns that are pretty big, and they run due east-west, and uh, we know that they're of uh, not of any colonial origin, because the the moss carpets on them have been dated and they're going back to five or more hundred years so we know they predate colonization but no one has any idea what they are you now we've asked abenaki elders and they don't know the only hypothesis they come up with is that their creation stories had it that the uh the souls of the dead went west and then up into the milky way and since these were running east west near a mountain summit they wondered if these might be directional sort of guidelines to help the souls migrate in the right way, but uh, it's not really known for sure. We have someone asking if you can recommend a good source for more information about indigenous stonework. Well, I think probably a good book is called Manitou, New England Spiritual Landscape, but it would apply to New York certainly. And it was written by two oceanographers out of Woods Hole, James Marver and Byron Dix. <clears throat> And they're mostly looking at solstice chambers and things like that, but it has a lot of good information in it. And then we have a person with their hand raised. I'm gonna unmute them. This is Julie Rubin. And let me just see, Julie, are you able to talk? I am, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Great. I just attended a seminar last night on Native American artifacts. They found um, what appears to be a Native American site near Chappaqua, New York. And they identified a curving wall as a snake wall with a large boulder and at one end, which would have been the head of the snake. And it seems like it was ritualistic. Um, they also found some circles that were early prehistoric Native American circles. Cool. Stone circles. Yeah. yeah. So I wondered how much you see that in your uncovering of of landscape um I, I i 
I do, I do encounter it um, more down in, you know, the southern part of New York and New England than I do up here where I'm living now. Um, matter of fact, there's quite a bit down in the lower Hudson uh, area of New York. So it's a place that has a lot of indigenous stonework. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it's not uncommon. Um, all right, so these, these, these look like they may be pasture walls or hayfield walls. I'm seeing no small rock associated with these two intersecting walls. Uh, again, usually one stack high. So most likely, um, you know, uh, walls that are protecting hayfields uh, from livestock uh, or keeping livestock in separate pastures. The one thing I will mention is the wall, the, uh, the wall that's running back on the right-hand side, it looks really level in there. Um, and again, the soil looks higher than the, the, the other, the left-hand side of the wall. So Mike, I have a question. If you kept going to the right, <clears throat> does all of a sudden the land start sloping up to the right? Oh, this wasn't Mike's picture. Um, this is Carol. So I'll ask Carol. Carol, if you're looking at this wall that's running out away from us, on the right, it's very flat. On the right-hand side, it's very flat. If you continue into the woods on the right, does that slope upwards? She has answered, um, yes, it does. Okay. So um, I'm gonna have to take that back. This is a crop field because what we're looking at there, that really flat area is what's called a bottom plow terrace. So again, I mentioned that in crop fields, the ground was always plowed across the contour and the plow for real push down slope. Um, so if you have a, a slope coming down and then it levels off and then continues again, you're looking at a bottom plow terrace. And that's definitely the work of a crop field that was plowed <laughs> for many years and a lot of soil migrated down there. Um, <clears throat> so I'm guessing the reason we're not seeing many small fist-sized stones is generally the stones went off to the side walls. It's easier taking a stone boat and just running it along the contour to a wall then going down slope and then having to drag it back up. Um, so again, I guess definitely crop field um, on the uphill side of that, that wall. All right, next slide. Okay, so here we had a <clears throat> wintertime flooding event um, where it was cold enough to freeze uh, the, the, the top of that flood water, and then the water level uh, fell as the flood waters drained away, leaving this nice uh, sheet of ice perched a foot or two above uh, the current water level. All right, next slide. And, and Tom, I'm gonna interrupt you just quickly to ask the name of the book again from Woods Hole. Several folks are oh, asking um, that title. Manitou, New England Spiritual Landscape. Okay, super, thank you. Yeah, so I can't quite tell what species of tree this is, um, but these are definitely cankers uh, growing out of it. Um, these could be either from fungal infection, bacterial infection, or viral infection. Um, so this tree is infected with something that is causing this sort of tumorous growth. Um, but again, I'm not sure the species. It may be beech. Uh, it looks like it's sort of smooth bark. But um, again, some sort of cankerous growth associated with these trees. All right, if there's no comments or questions, I guess we can go on the next one. All right, so um, I'm definitely seeing a stream here, some trees that are bent and tipped you know, around. There's one tree on the right that looks like it's either a tree or a limb that is growing up and then it bends down and then goes straight up again. Um, that was a limb or a tree that was <clears throat> basically fell upon by another tree. Another tree hit there and uh, basically hit into that, that sort of little U at the bottom of that bend bending the limb down, uh, most likely uh, a, 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 a twig just beyond where that bend was, took off to be the new major growth growing back up. And the rest of the, the tree that was bent down probably towards the stream or the branch that was bent down to the stream uh, eventually died and, and rotted away. 
but um, certainly something like that, definitely a, a weight bend from another tree landing on that tree or branch. I can't tell which it is, but one of the two. And again, that's on the, the left-hand side of the stream there. All right, if there's no questions or comments, we can continue on. Hmm. All right, so this is definitely a rock escarpment. Okay, Mohawk Mountain. So this is over in the Schwangunks, and we're getting uh, this escarpment, and then we're getting talus slopes forming at the base of the escarpment. Uh, talus is, you know, large blocks of rock that <clears throat> break off and build an apron at the base of the cliff. So you can see that uh, on the photo on the left, you can see sort of a little bit of apron at the, the base of that sort of um, outcrop that's closest to us. And it looks like uh, we have some moss that's growing in one of the cracks in some of this talus. Um, but uh, certainly, you know, um, a talus slope forming at the base of a cliff. And if there's no other questions or comments, we can go on. Uh, Okay, so it's saying it's a limestone outcrop, um, which is makes sense for Taconic. That's an area where there is a lot of uh, limestone. I know that area well because uh, I summered there for many, many years. In any case, um, you know, this is just an outcropping of rock that's here. And one thing you can see is a lot of moss growing on it. Uh, that's common with limestone. It tends to... Um, you know, sort of be weathered by slightly acidic rain. So it gets porous. The moss can attach to it and grow into the, those pore spaces. So uh, pretty common uh, to be seen. All right, any questions or comments about that? All right, next slide, I guess. All right, so here's a beaver that's very ambitious. It's going after quite a large hardwood tree. Um, and it's done a good job, but it's going to have to do a lot more there. Uh, so again, you know, this is, you know, it's trying to take this tree down to get branches that are basically up to as much as six inches in diameter that it can cut up into lengths and drag away uh, to be basically stuck into the mud of its, you know, beaver pond. Um, so that uh, that will service as its winter food supply. Um, this looks like it's actually on a river or stream, which means the beaver probably is in a bank lodge and where it's stashing this stuff would be <clears throat> on the inside of a, a, a meander in the river where the current is not so strong. Um, but in any case, uh, you know, beavers like to chew on things. They're gonna work on it and it may eventually get this tree down, but it's gonna be a lot of work to do it. And on the previous slide, someone was wondering with the limestone with the moss, was it a glacial erratic? They could be erratic, because I'm not seeing an outcrop right here. So, um, you know, we can say it's definitely, it would definitely be a glacial boulder. It would be an erratic if the bedrock underneath it was of a different type. So erratics are only boulders that occur on a different type of bedrock from what they're, they're formed from. Uh, but any boulder moved by the glaciers would be called a glacial boulder, whether it's erratic or not. All right, next slide. Wow, now that is something. So this looks like a, a spring, certainly, that someone has done a very nice job having it run down to another catchment area and I don't know if that's going into a pipe and going somewhere because I don't see it servicing again, but um, very cool. Someone had a very artistic bent in this. So, um, you know, I it, it could have gone for, that's why I'm asking if there's a pipe in there. It could have been like a water source for livestock or something. Um, but if there's a pipe coming out of that lower end, it may be taking it somewhere else. All right, if no questions or comments on that, we can go to the next one. <clears throat> okay, so here are definitely stone cairns. Um, so 
these I'd have to really go on site to see. See, these could be of Native American origin. I'd have to see the context of these things. We can get clearance cairns. Clearance cairns were, again, areas where there was a lot of rock on the land when it was being worked and uh, people built, you know, built up these cairns to get rid of the rock. But these don't look that big. And I'd have to see the configuration of them to know if they're related to agricultural activity or if this is uh, indigenous stonework. So I can't really tell from the slide. I don't know if Barbara has any other information that might help us with that or not. Um, but it, it would be an interesting site I'd like to look at to try to figure out. All right, if no other comments or questions, I guess we can move on to the next one. All right, so this definitely looks like it might be a solstice chamber. And this might be related. If this is near where those parents were, although I see it's a different person that took this shot. But in any case, I'm guessing this is probably a solstice chamber, particularly with the stone line roof. Um, there were chambers that were often made with stone, but uh, if they're made by columns, they usually didn't use rock on the roof. They usually used wood and then would just cover that with, uh, you know, uh, dirt and stuff if they're making like, uh, you know, a place to store root crops or something like that. But when you see a stone roof like that, you're usually looking at in indigenous stonework. So um, if this is a solstice chamber, it would be looking out. If you stood in that doorway looking out, you'd either be looking up east, I mean, north of east, that would be for the uh, summer solstice sunrise or south of east for the winter solstice sunrise. It could be an equinox chamber too if it's looking due east, but generally, uh, okay, let's just see. The lower one is oriented toward the winter solstice. All right, so again, winter solstice chamber. Yeah, so that makes sense to me. And I should mention that, you know, the winter solstice was uh, very important for some indigenous groups. Um, like I think the... Uh, the Abenaki had a, a feast of dreams associated with it being the longest night of the year. There was a sense that if you can get in an entranced state, you could actually contact dead relatives. So it was very important to know exactly when the winter solstice was. So these chambers were very helpful in, in terms of pinpointing that actual day. All right, if no questions or comments, we've been wondering. How would they raise the enormous stones without farm animals? Well, you know, it's interesting. You can, you know, use logs as rollers. And I, I figured this out. The first house I built was a uh, chinkless construction log house. And I was with one hand uh, rolling 40 foot white pine logs around the building site. Uh, so I had short sections of log rollers and I, you know, I bar up an end of the log, get a roller on it, do the same the other end I'd have, and I could just push it along. And I quickly learned if I took the front roller and angled it, then the log would just turn around a bend. So if I could, with one hand, move a 40 foot, 40 foot white pine log, I would think uh, native people with log rollers could roll these big stones up on top of that structure without too much trouble. And someone else was wondering if chambers like these were protected. I hope they're protected because uh, they have a lot of historic value. Uh, a lot of them were built on bedrock because then you wouldn't get leveraging from, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of freeze and thaw cycles. Um, but I, I hope they're protected. All right, next slide. All right, so here we have an. A, it looks like a berm. That is really interesting. Um, you know, I'm not sure what this is. You know, it'd be interesting to know, like if uh, if Kelly's there, how, what's the length of this? How long it goes for? Um, because that might inform us what its use was. Uh, but yeah, I, I have no idea what it is. <clears throat> I mean, Kelly. Okay, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's trench and burn because it's not that 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 the trench is just not deep enough to really work in that fashion. Well, Kelly uh, says it goes on for about a hundred feet. Huh. 
Yeah, I'm not sure what that is, but it's pretty interesting. Else, someone else is saying if this is on Nana Mountain, there was an arsenic mine there. Oh, well, I don't know how that would relate to an arsenic mine, but um, I mean, if it's only 100 feet long, it's certainly not long enough to be like anything for containing livestock or anything like that. So, And Kelly is saying it is near an old ar arsenic mine. Oh, well, I, you know, I mean, it could be a place where they're dumping, you know, material. That's a possibility, but I, I can't tell from the slide. Mm. All right, I guess next one. All right, so we have here a stream, you know, in winter time. Um, I don't know what else to say about it. I mean, I can see a, a bent tree. I don't know if that's a down tree over towards the left there. Um, so, I mean, if that, you know, if that tree is still rooted, then that would have been bent over by weight with something falling on it. But other than that, I don't really have much to say about it unless there's a particular question or comment. Oh, I see the right, I should read these. What the what people are writing is I'm looking at the shot, not reading. So okay, a bent cherry tree over the stream. Well, again, yeah, that would probably be uh, bent over by with a bend like that. Whenever you get bends like this, that means weight bent. So that was bent over by probably another tree falling on it. Uh, bends that go like this are are trees get wind tipped and then they get a bend in them. So in this case, this cherry that would have been weight bent uh, and most likely a tree that fell on it and brought it over like that. Okay, next slide. Oh, this looks like it was a, a, a maple possibly that got hit by uh, Eurasian bittersweet. Um, bittersweet is one of our vines, uh, invasive vines that spirals like this. So um, it spiraled up. Obviously somebody removed uh, the vine because it's no longer there, but it tends to strangle trees like this. So this would be yeah, a tree that was hit by bittersweet and then later the vine was removed. Okay, next slide. All right, this looks like it's definitely uh, probably an abandoned beaver pond. Um, we have all these standing dead snags in there. So at one point this was flooded by beaver then abandoned, the pond drained, and now it's undergoing marsh uh, succession. Um, but uh, originally uh, a beaver, uh, you know, inhabitant. So I see a standing hand raised from Terry. Terry, I'm going to allow you to talk. Are you able to hop on? Let's see, Terry, are you on? Okay. All right, I guess we'll go to the next one. Yeah. Okay, so here, yeah, we have some Eastern red cedars in here. So this is definitely agricultural land um, that was abandoned. Um, the cedars came in, so it certainly wasn't a, a crop field, but either a hay field or pasture before abandonment. Then abandonment, um, the forest grew up around them, shaded the cedars, which died. They can persist <coughs> for quite some time because their wood is quite rot resistant. So if you do see the, the skeletal remains of dead cedars, out in the woods, a very good indicator of uh, agricultural lands that were abandoned. And we have a hand raised from Robert. Robert, I'm going to allow you to talk. If you unmute Robert, you should be able to talk. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Rob Buchanan. Um, a, a couple of things um, I put in the comments, and you can find it there. There's an organization called NERA, the New England Antiquities Research Association. NERA.org is their website. 
they are an organization and I'm a member of it that is dedicated to the uh, documenting of Native American and other stonework and, and other histories uh, throughout New England, New York, uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Um, they are a great resource for anyone who's looking for information about Native American um, stonework, indigenous stonework. Um, so I, I live quite near to where the, the, the photos of the Putnam Valley um, stoneworks there. And um, I can say that throughout Northern Westchester and Putnam County, is a very active area. It is, um, there are a lot of Native American stone sites as in, and I was part of the group that found the uh, stone, stone structures that the, someone earlier was talking about in Chappaqua and there's a big effort going on to save the land and preserve those stone structures. But um, so yeah, for, for more information, Look for nearer.org. Excellent, thank you. All right, next slide, I guess. We had a question about the cedars. Could they be dying because they're getting shaded out by taller trees over time, or is there another reason? No, that's the reason. They're you know they're slow growing trees. They're shade intolerant. So as the younger, faster growing trees grow up over them, they shade them, and that that's what does them in. All right, so this looks like it was a wind-tipped, it looks like it might be a white ash or tulip tree, but the bow is going like this. So this is a tree that was probably tipped when it was quite young uh, by the wind and then straightened up, uh, creating that bow uh, in, its, in its trunk like that. Um, and uh, obviously everything else around it is quite a bit younger. So this tree, um, you know, is is a holdout from from a time when uh, it may have been growing by itself, and it actually looks like it has uh, evidence of lower limbs. Those those knobs on the left hand side going up, also the right, uh, would have been because was it growing up, it had more light, so it could have lower limbs like that. But certainly a, a wind tipped bow in the trunk there. Okay, um, no questions or comments, we can continue on. All right, so this looks like it may just be deadfall trees. Um, certainly the, there's some trees in here that have just snapped off or came down. Uh, this could have been, you know, um, from, you know, just trees that died in the struggle to get in the canopy, although it looks like there's a number of standing dead pine there. Uh, so are these are these red pine? Does anyone know if these are red pine trees that were hit by red pine scale? Because that could be a guess. I mean, uh, red pine scale is really decimating red pines uh, throughout the Northeast. And uh, since there's so many standing dead trees here, it's, it's making me think, and they're pine, I can see the limb whorls on them. It's making me think that maybe these are red pine and now we're seeing them starting to come down. Uh, that would be my guess. And, and the next slide also relates to this. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, just, just the sheer number of trees that are falling down, snapping off. Um, I'm guessing red pine, uh, that, that that's what happened. These were killed by red pine scale. And actually it looks like well, I can't really be sure if that's bark in the foreground. I can't really tell, but yeah, just the sheer number. I mean, the only other possibility would be that we had a a, a good fire in here, here that heat killed these trees, and then eventually they they're falling down. You know, um, after the fact. But one of the two, either heat killed pines or red pine killed by red pine scale. Oh. I should read this. All right. There was a tornado touchdown on the Cape. All right. Possible, but, you know, um, unless these were all snapped off, I'm, I'm, don't, I'm not thinking 
I'm not thinking, you know, tornadic winds here, but it looks like a lot of these things are just snapped off down near ground level. Usually when you get wind snap trees, it's going to happen way higher up, like mid trunk height. Okay, next slide. Oh. And that is our last slide. So oh. From the audience. Okay. I have a couple more general questions. If you're open okay. to taking just a couple more. Yeah. So we have someone wondering, are there any books or scholars developing pre-colonial forest forensics generally? Pre-colonial, not that I'm aware of. Um, it'd be a great thing to do. Uh, you know, I. it's, it's hard because, um, I mean, the only thing we really have is the stonework, which is is pretty instructive in its own right. But um, and we do know that, you know, indigenous people did use fire along river systems for their crop fields to clear them and maintain them. Um, but, you know, they they didn't work the land like it was worked intensively like the, the colonists did with huge amounts of plowing and pastures and things like that. So. Um, <clears throat> I mean, another artifact we can see uh, are pointer trees. So pointer trees are trees that native people bent over. There are young trees bent over. So they, they grow up and they bend over close to ground level and then start up again. Um, you're seeing trees like that. that are 300 years or older. Those are definitely pointer trees or pointing significant features uh, in the landscape, either ritualistically or just functionally. Um, but if there is anyone doing work on pre-colonial stuff, I'd be very intrigued. I don't know of anyone doing that other than archaeologists, but that's different than looking at landscape patterns generally. Yeah. And someone is wondering, where is the best place to get your books? Well, I mean, um, I'd say go to your local bookstore, and if they don't have them, order them through them. I mean, generally, I just notice nowadays that books don't have very long shelf lives in bookstores. So um you know, they, there's a lot of turnover, but if, you know, I think you can just go in and ask, uh, you know, for a, a bookstore, if you have a local bookstore to, to order them and give them the business, um, you can go on something like Amazon to see all the books that I've done. And then you can decide which ones you might be interested in. And then we have one more person wondering, do trees tend to fall in the same direction of the prevailing storms? And what makes a tree uproot versus break off? What are some of the barriers? Yeah, so um, trees generally, if it, if it is a wind event uh, other than a tornado, they're all going to go generally in the same direction. So yeah, if you're getting a lot of down trees with upturned root systems, that's definitely all lined up in the same way. That's that's a wind event. And like I said, if the winds are out of the west, you're looking at thunderstorms or out of the east, either hurricanes or nor'easters. Um, snapping trees usually happen when a tree has a weakness mid trunk and it's getting hit by a very quick blast of wind, you know, generally if you're getting <laughs> sustained strong winds, that's going to uproot trees. But if your tree is hit really quickly by a very hard blast, it can often just snap before it uproots. Um, so that, that's one reason they'll snap like that. For our final question, Tom, because excuse you for the support and coming through all these these photos, and we have far more questions than we could ever get through in this evening. It's been a really engaged audience. In the Hudson Valley, about how long do fallen trees remain as remnants on the forest floor before they're so decayed you can't tell a tree was there? Okay, so that that depends on species of tree, site condition and the size of trees. So obviously larger trees are gonna take longer to decay away than smaller ones. Uh, on dry sites, like if you're up on, you know, rocky ridge tops, trees are, the down trees are gonna persist longer because there's less moisture. Um, and then the trees that decay the slowest are, are um, for conifers would be like our, our hemlock and white pine. You know, a good size hemlock and white pine can be around for a good, 70 or more years before they're completely decayed away. Um, but outlasting them would be things like white oak, American chestnut, black locust. They all have trunks that can lie on the forest floor for over a century and still be there. Um, all three of them hollow out because their most rot resistant wood is on the outside. Uh, so they often are these hollow trunks on the ground. 
And like I said, uh, they can be there for well over a century before they start to break down and, and disappear. So depends on tree species, size, and site condition. Generally, most of our hardwood trees, maples, beech, elm, ash, trees like that, they do not persist very long. You know, even a big, big beech or sugar maple, after about 30 years, is going to be pretty much almost gone. Yeah. Uh, but white pine hemlock usually make it to 70, and then white oak, chestnut, American chestnut, black locust will make it over a century. And again, yeah. they hollow out. They They rot in the opposite way from pines and hemlocks, which rot from the outside in, they rot from the inside out. And this is my real final question, because this has also been asked in a couple ways. Do you have any more of these talks lined up anywhere? Because folks want to send you pictures. No, so. well, um, I, I'd have to ask my wife, Marcia. She's the business person that does all the booking of these things. So I don't know if I do or don't. Um, I can't think of any right now that I know of coming up. Um, but I'll tell you what, if I'll check with her and then if I do have them, I will email you, Lori, and then you, you can get back to that individual or and, post. And we, of course, Tom, and you know this because I've said this, would love to have you back, Carrie, in person if, if, if we can work that out. So we would be happy to host again. It's been really wonderful talking yeah, with like, you. Yeah. And like I said, I am going to be down that way sometime this summer. I don't know when, but as soon as I know, I'll contact you. Keep me posted. It's been great having you this evening and, and walking through the landscape with you. I think we've all learned a tremendous lot. And everyone that's tuned in to the presentation will be sending a video. We'll be adding some of the resources that were discussed this evening. So if folks didn't get things written down, we'll add that to the follow-up email. So you'll have that information. I just want to thank you for, the, for a wonderful presentation, Tom. All right. Well, thank you. Have an excellent night. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care.